for today's discussion and as of this morning as well i have learned that it continues to be sold out across bookstores in delhi this is a testament to the book to the book's compelling narrative and meticulous research so congratulations ambassador rana on achieving this now a book on sir winston churchill and india is no small feat uh so winston churchill is widely known as a force who shaped british politics and led the empire to victory in world war 2 however his actions in the colonies and his views on race and imperialism have resulted in somewhat of a mixed legacy that has divided opinion particularly in the indian subcontinent in this book ambassador rana takes a closer look at churchill examines the back story of this complex and multifaceted figure through extensive research and analysis ambassador rana has sought to uncover the experiences and events that led churchill to be viewed both as a hero and a villain at the same time now it's evident that ambassador rana has invested several years of several years in research and writing of this book and i do remember reading in the book as well that the first inspiration came in 1999 This explains how the book is rich yet a lucid exploration of Churchill's life and legacy and Ambassador Rana draws on the immense archival work and historical scholarship to present a very nuanced perspective on this iconic figure. I won't speak much about much more about the book because we have two stellar uh, people in conversation today. talking about the book we have ambassador kishan esrana in conversation with mr ramu damodram who is joining us very early from the united states thank you for both of you for being here and being a part of our flagship dialogue i'll just give a brief introduction and then mr damodram it's over to you to begin the discussion so ambassador kishan rana joined the indian foreign service in 1960 and served in the indian embassy in china He was later the Indian ambassador, high commissioner to Algeria, Czechoslovakia, Kenya, Mauritius, Germany, and he also served on Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's staff. He speaks Chinese and French, in addition to English and Hindi, of course. And he is the Professor Emeritus Diplo Foundation, Malta and Geneva Emeritus Fellow Institute of Chinese Studies, Archives by Fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge, and a Public Policy Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington D.C. he's authored and edited 11 books 12 now in, and we are delighted to host him today for his latest book on churchill and india manipulation or betrayal mr ramu damodaran is a non resident fellow at senior fellow at cesep he has worked at the united nations for more than 30 years most recently as the chief of partnerships and public engagements in the united nations department of global communications until may 2021 He has also been the secretary of the United Nations General Assembly Committee on Information from 2011 to 2021. He has been a member of the Indian Foreign Service where he was promoted to the rank of ambassador and he also served as executive assistant to the Prime Minister of India between 91 and 94 as well as in diplomatic missions in Moscow and to the United Nations apart from holding a range of national governmental ministries. it is my pleasure to have it is our pleasure actually to have you both for the for this discussion today and mr damodaran over to you to take this forward thank you very much thank you thank you so much ria and uh, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us thank you sir ambassador rana for having invested the time this evening i was told that one of the cardinal rules of uh, conversations in a in a discussion like this is to avoid three words i remember when but i'm going to break that rule because ria you mentioned ambassador rana's career beginning with the indian embassy in china in the early 60s my my father was fortunate to work with ambassador rana at that time and i was fortunate to be with my parents in beijing and i remember we used to have a very closely knit embassy community and every few weeks one of the uncles and aunties in the embassy used to call everyone else home for dinner and i remember one such evening in january 1965 when we all met at uh, one of the aunties homes winston churchill had just died and the conversation that evening was all about him and i recall how positive and genuinely mournful everyone was about him and his memory as as you said ria 
He was a force that shaped not just British, but global politics. And I think of that evening and the approbation that Churchill received. And I think of the world, what is it now, uh, half a century later, when there's been so much research and investigation, most recently Ambassador Rana's pivotal work, which showed Churchill in a completely new, transformed, and frankly, much less likable light. And I thought we'd begin our conversation, Ambassador Rana, by asking you, how did this change in perception, in attitude, shape and occur? Thank you very much, Ramu. Uh, it's wonderful you, of you to evoke the old connections, <laughs> but it wasn't that your father was fortunate to work with me. It is somebody like me, completely raw, completely untutored, uh, who had the privilege of working with such a great man as Ambassador A.K. Damodaran, or Damu, as we called him. It is to my great regret that in those years, I was perhaps not as wise as I ought to have been in sitting more at his feet and learning from him. Uh, your father, Ramu, really has been one of the iconic figures in our service. And I don't say this to flatter you. This is a universal opinion in the service. Uh, when did things change about Churchill? You know, the Churchill Archives has just published something that they call, in a very British way, the Churchill Companion. Uh, this is really a collection of 20 essays on Winston Churchill. And the introductory essay written by the director of Churchill Archives, Alan Packwood, begins with this very point, the change in the perception about Churchill. I have truthfully not studied this closely enough to give an authoritative answer. But I understand this evolution, a marked evolution began around 2018 or so, when a couple of statues were disfigured. And a wave of criticism began to emerge. Um, this is something worth examination. And I plan to delve a little deeper in this. It is also evident that in Africa, there are African intellectuals who have uh, raised serious questions. And then, of course, there are uh, South Asians living in the, the UK. Professor Priya Gopal is one. Tariq Ali, uh, a well-known Indian figure who made his home in the UK a long time back, uh, has also published a book uh, which came out in May last year. Uh, which also makes some rather sweeping attacks on Churchill. So there is new stuff beginning to come out. And mind you, uh, even before this, uh, several biographers had begun to take a more critical view. Thank you. you your microphone is off. Sorry, yes. can you hear me now, sir? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, I think the point that you make about uh, a deeper understanding that has come about Churchill in recent years is, in a sense, mirrored by the what you describe as a very shallow understanding that Churchill had of India. And in particular, his inability to realize that we were a nation which welcomed not always, but some of the time, but we did assimilate influences that came into our land, foreign influences, and absorb them. So there was a constant, in your lovely phrase, a sense of visitors finding their harmony within India and becoming Indian. And that sense of a unique Indianness, which was beyond Churchill's capacity to understand. He thought that we were 
in a sense, bound to be subservient. That when a visitor or an invader came to India, we would in effect play second to them. How far did that feeling, despite the fact that many of his earlier years were in India, his first published book was set in India, how did that influence the Churchill about whom you researched and have written? Ramu, uh, there are two points I would make in response. The first is that um, after my book went to press, in fact, after it was published, I read the remarkable diary of the Soviet ambassador in the UK, who used to have conversations with Winston Churchill. And there is a conversation that is cited in one of the major biographies, um, which in effect, Churchill says that all kinds of invaders came into India from the north and the Indians were defeated by them and they had no capacity to resist. And he saw India as in land of effete people, although he doesn't use that word, uh, as a people who were easily conquered. Yes, I think that is a phrase he uses in some fashion. And this was his overall assessment of India. As conveyed to the Soviet ambassador in London in uh, 1942, perhaps, uh, the citation is available. The second point connected with that is that um, Churchill, it's often said that Churchill uh, learned everything uh, important about uh, the Victorian approach and the Victorian ethic from his father. You know, like many sweeping statements, it's only partly true. Churchill worshipped his father. And father, mind you, uh, Lord Randolph, had an attitude of disdain and um, one might almost say contempt, but let's say disparaging attitude towards his son. Um, lots of evidence. Somebody has calculated that while Churchill was at school in two different schools, total of eight years or nine years, he sent some 500 odd letters to his parents and he received 31 replies. And most of those replies berated him for being a bad student, for not paying attention and for his underperformance. But put that aside, there was one important dimension of Lord Randolph which Churchill failed to understand. Um, Lord Randolph came on a visit to India in 1885, just before he became Secretary of State for India. He spent five months in India, in the typical grand tour of those days. And in Bengal, and I think also visiting Madaras, as it was then called, or Varanasi, he learned that the water carriers from these regions were being sent off to the Northwest Frontier Province, and even to Sudan. And he wrote to the governor uh, of Bengal saying that this is outrageous. Why are these poor people being sent away? They will never come back alive from these places. In parliament, Randolph Churchill made a remarkable uh, demand before he became Secretary of State. He said that a commission should be set up to inquire into the way in which Britain was ruling India. And he criticized the British government for not paying enough attention to the welfare of Indians. A remarkable insight for a man uh, in the um, 19th century. Churchill imbibed none of this. Churchill had an attitude of contempt and indifference. Um, I won't say more on this, but lots and lots of evidence is available. Thank you. 
been dreamt and in different sanctuary. It's fascinating to think that Churchill never, as you point out, visited India in the 20th century. His last visit was in 1899. And a generation later, the British Empire was at its height with a quarter of the Earth's land surface and some 460 million subjects. And it was at this point that uh, Randolph Churchill coined a phrase, which I know that you have challenged on, on petrochemical grounds, of yes. India being the vast sheet of oil to keep the ocean free of storms. But we are no, here. No, at the... Sorry, sorry, Ramu. Uh, saying that British rule was a sheet right. of oil which kept right. the India's dissensions and upheavals under control. Sorry. And no, how do you react to that? Well, Ramu, uh, first, as I tried to say, a sheet of oil simply um, uh, removes the surface turbulence, but it does nothing to what's happening inside. But of course, that that analogy is false in the sense that there were periods of great tranquility, harmony, and creativity in India. The word syncretic culture, a country that would absorb ideas, influences, objects, methods from others without feeling uprooted or without losing its own inner balance, that was India. And Churchill never understood that. You know, it's a, it's a huge tragedy that Churchill never talked to anybody in India who could give him information. He wrote to his mother within weeks of reaching Bangalore that there is nobody here who can tell me anything about India because he was ensconced in the regimental ethos, in the uh, ways of living of young subalterns in a cavalry regiment. Mind you, cavalry regiments are among the most, uh, what shall I say, ethos-driven, if I can use such a phrase. If only Churchill has, had reached out to one of the old ICS officers. He didn't do that for a trivial reason. He said, you know, these guys over here, these Anglo-Indians, very interesting, Ramu. The word Anglo-Indian was initially used to describe British uh, officials, uh, army or civilian, who had spent many years in India. And it was only with the census of 1901 that Anglo-Indian came to be used to describe the offsprings of mixed marriages, essentially um, uh, British fathers and Indian mothers. Anyway, so Churchill didn't meet or connect with any of them. And um, that left him with a completely superficial understanding of India. You know that uh, last what night was I on the surface. Sorry, Sorry, sir? He just took what was on yeah. the surface without right. digging any deeper. Absolutely. No, I was, uh, last night I chanced upon a rerun of uh, Gurinder Chadha's Bride and Prejudice. And there's a line where Lalitha tells Darcy, your problem is you want to go to India, but you don't want to deal with Indians. And I think that really sums <laughs> up the, the Churchill that you described. I think uh, that's about it. Yeah. We're at the Center for Social and Economic Progress. And one fact that you bring out in your book about the fact that the economy in India barely grew for about 100 years from 0.38% per annum between 1820 and 1870, peaking at 0.97% between 1870 and 1913, and then declining to 0.23% between 1913 and 1950. How does this very bleak economic picture of the jewel in the crown relate to the policies and, if I may say, indifference of Winston Churchill? See, Ramu, uh, I've used two quotations from Churchill's speeches in Parliament. In one that dates to the 30s, um, and when he was in the middle of his um, uh, big-headed opposition to the Government of India Act of 1935, which was, in a way, giving a little bit of power to India at a glacial pace 
meaning uh, that provinces would be ruled by governments elected on communal rights, on communal uh, ballots. So Churchill said in parliament, uh, the, 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 what shall I say, the expansive, enlightened picture. I don't have the quotation in front of me, but he basically said that we are there for the welfare of Indians. We are there to do good for them. No, so, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I turned it upside down. He said, we are, we are there because we have rights in India. And our rights in India come from the sacrifices we have made in India. So, we have a right to exclusive trade with India, etc., etc. He was, incidentally, a former uh, president of the Board of Trade, meaning the Commerce Minister of Britain, way back in uh, 1908 or 9. So, he understood that commercial argument very well. He made another speech in Parliament in '46 when he was uh, in the opposition where he talks about, you know, the, the trust reposed in us by the people of India as members of the empire and how we have worked for their welfare. And all this was utter nonsense. I mean, basically, as you say, there was very low growth. Um, there is a lovely story from the 30s where apparently there was a drought of some kind in northern India. And Chamberlain, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer during that period, uh, it's probably 34 or 35, he writes to his sister that we have discovered a gold mine in India, that vast amounts of gold are coming into Britain from India, gold that was hoarded by Indian farmers who are now in distress and are selling their gold to survive. That is the story of exploitation of India. And there are many other stories. Shashi Tharoor, Daryl Ampal have written eloquently on this subject and uh, I salute them for having gone into this. The point that you made, Sam, in, on, the, on the commercial aspect, is something which I really found striking in your book because it's not um, an avenue really trodden by, by many writers. And, and you suggest actually that the commercial argument deserves more attention than it is usually received. While India, as you say, was a captive market, Churchill saw the empire as essential to the well-being of the governing right. as much as the governed. And in his famous alliteration, he said that had Britain addressed itself the moral and material prob problems that are at the root of Indian life, it would have been much better for the working folk of Burnley and Bombay, Oldham and Ahmedabad. Yes. But how do you reconcile that really with what you describe in a sense as the, the lost years from 1942 to 1945, when a victory in the war became increasingly imminent, but absolutely no thought was invested by Churchill in the future of India beyond that date and its economic and, yes, commercial standing in a global world order. Ramu, that period um, of the early 40s, when Churchill was prime minister from May 1940 to August 1945, it deserves very close study, but sadly, Many documents relevant to the study of the India connection are missing. Um, Narendra Sarila's book, In the Shadow of the Great Game, published in 2005, I think, uh, talks about British strategic planners who decided, who recommended that at the end of war, a Muslim state would be the best protector of British interests if and when Britain had to leave British India. Uh, and the reasoning is pretty evident. 
that this Muslim state would ally itself with Western powers, UK in particular, uh, because of its hostility towards the Hindu part of India uh, and because of its logical connections with the Muslim states of uh, the Middle East, as they called it, or West Asia, as we would call it today. Now, Churchill evidently supported this argument without saying so openly. And the lovely piece of evidence is uh, Roosevelt's letter of 11th April 1942, when the Crips mission is ending and Roosevelt wants Crips to stay on to make one last effort at a, uh, via media uh, in India between uh, British India, um, the national movement and the Muslim League. And Roosevelt uses a kind of mocking argument with Churchill when he says that while you talk about upholding, uh, while, you, while you talk about not giving self-rule to the national movement because you don't want to split that entity, you are willing to create a Muslim state over there by breaking up that entity. I mean, he's literally mocking him for what he was doing. And that letter produced probably the sharpest outburst from Churchill in the war rooms. And we know the story from uh, Churchill's, uh, from Roosevelt's special emissary uh, who was present with uh, Churchill over there. And who was written in his memoir uh, that Churchill swore and cursed for an hour. He wrote out a letter to Roosevelt in which he threatened to resign. I mean, it's a strange for the British Prime Minister to threaten the US President that he would resign if you are pushing me in a corner like this. And of course, that letter was not sent. Churchill was a master of that lovely twist he gave to diplomatic communication, the letter not sent, but handed over to somebody for transmission, in this case, uh, Roosevelt's personal envoy, and put on record but not as an official document. No, you know, we diplomats, we love these kind of, um, um, what shall I say, these innovations that people work out to communicate. So in effect, Churchill was communicating at two levels. Um, so what I'm getting at is, that was the British plan, the creation of a Muslim homeland in British India way back in 42. And the creation of Pakistan is a product of that. Now, if that was the intent, why did Churchill not begin to prepare for partition? And for me, this is the most, most uh, powerful charge to be laid at Churchill's door, that you wasted those three years from August 42 to middle of 45 when Nehru, Patel and, Jin, and um, uh, Molan Azad and others were released. Uh, and he literally fiddled during those years. A la Nero. Actually, this, uh, this last comment of yours uh, brings to mind three important points in the final chapter of your book. One, of course, on on Pakistan, where you use a phrase that he patched together an ungovernable Pakistan. Institutional viability, coherence, and sustainability were never really studied. 
it simply became a matter of conceding Jinnah's claims in a momentum created out of divisive politics. And then on the Roosevelt uh, angle, I'd like to refer to what you mentioned, not so much about Franklin, but Eleanor Roosevelt, where Churchill told both of them that the Western powers should decide the future of the Indian subcontinent. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, democracies should decide with India in mind. And the third point, which really intrigues me from, from where I'm located, is your reference to the Atlantic Charter, which uh, Churchill finalized with Roosevelt, which in many ways was the inception point, if you will, for the United Nations. And you make the point that in that, there was no possible provision at all for a future India to be a permanent member of the Security Council. But what strikes me is the fact that India, despite being a dominion at that time in 1945, was invited to the San Francisco conference that drafted the Charter of the United Nations. So there seems to be a certain ambivalence or waveriness, if you will, on the part of Churchill when it came to India standing in the world and what would benefit Britain in the long run, a visible India or a thwarted below the radar India? How do you react to that? Uh, let's put aside the Atlantic Charter for a moment. I mean, the points you make on that are very interesting and worth examination. But um, the point you raised before that related, Ramu, just uh, jog my memory, please. Um, you, you mean about uh, that democracy should decide the future of India, including yes, India? Yes, yes, that's right. See, the, the, that particular conversation took place at the White House uh, in uh, end of December, early January. Pearl Buck had sent a private communication uh, a letter to Eleanor, and they were friends. And she said, mind you, this is just after Pearl Harbor, weeks after Pearl Harbor. And Pearl, uh, Pearl Buck wrote to Eleanor that there is a kind of unity of colored people that is emerging. That is, the non-whites are in a sense coming to some kind of unity in the face of all this. And um, Roosevelt got the point immediately, and he told Eleanor that I will force Churchill to give self-rule to India um, to, as a dominion or whatever. He couldn't do that. He failed completely. And Churchill uh, boasted afterwards that he uh, responded to Roosevelt with such ferocity that he said Roosevelt did not raise this issue with me directly after that. There is a little truth in that. What Roosevelt did afterwards was that he used his emissaries to tackle Churchill on self-rule in India. And they had their heads bitten off by Churchill in, the, uh, in his uh, flamboyant fashion, etc. But, you know, Ram, there is a subtle... What shall I say? Message that is conveyed when one major leader does not personally raise an issue but leaves it to his senior assistants to raise it. And it is actually quite insulting to the other leader. And this is part of the shifting balance between Roosevelt and Churchill. And that's Another ball game altogether, another huge area worth research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I won't get into that. It's not part of my story in any case. There is another aspect to the FDR uh, interest in India. FDR was motivated by India as a major market for the United States. And this was never spoken out openly. And a third point about the US-India-Britain connection. On the Indian side, we completely failed 
to connect with Roosevelt. In 1940, there was a plan for Krishna Menon to go to the US and nobody stopped to think that the British would never give permission because they had to give permission. Uh, Krishna Menon traveled on a passport issued by the British and they simply said uh, that we don't give you an endorsement to go to the US. You know how passports are. Uh, they are specific to countries or all countries. Now, all country passports were not uh, in the fashion in those days. So the sending country or the country that issued the passport indirectly had control over where a person could go. Nehru had plans in 1940 to visit the US and he couldn't go. Of course, he was preoccupied with uh, the events in India. But why did we not better connect with Roosevelt? Uh, this is a mystery. Um, what else um, have I left out? Atlantic Charter. Yes. Atlantic Charter. Uh, the point I make is uh, debatable. And I've said that. I've said that there are people who will disagree with me. You know, the Atlantic Charter was almost an accident. Uh, it was issued as a, as a general statement. Nobody thought that the Atlantic Charter would become a foundational document that would lead to the post-war world order. Um, the Atlantic Charter document repeatedly talks about all countries, all people, regardless of political uh, color, etc., etc. And Churchill simply said, it doesn't apply to India. And by, this was by end of 1941, uh, I think it was in September 41, that Churchill denied in the British Parliament that the Atlantic Charter categorically does not apply to India. It relates only to the European countries, essentially white countries. Um, and that is how Churchill uh, reasoned. Now, if he, if Churchill had not taken that position, would it have altered India's status in the post-war order? I just don't know. You are completely right that Britain, uh, that India did attend the San Francisco conference. Um, I think India and the Philippines were two uh, entities which were not full states in those days which attended. But I have a, another question, Ramu, which um, uh, no great multilateralist has, uh, has clarified for me. And this has nothing to do with Churchill, but it's all to do with India. It's all to do with the global south. When we were present at San Francisco and um, I think it was the San Francisco discussions that led to the UN Charter on uh, Human Rights. How come the right to development, the right to a decent life, a right to food and security was not placed in the human rights document? Uh, you are a great multilateralist. Um, uh, nobody has clarified for me or told me why we didn't do that. Yes, we say that we brought in women's rights, which was a great, great Indian achievement. Um, uh, and uh, that is highly commendable. But we all forgot about the right to economic development. It's a very critical point. And I think it also, in a sense, <clears throat> echoes the the reference that you made to, frankly, to white and non-white, European and non-European, or the phrase of Pearl Buck about non-white people. You've headed uh, three of India's key missions in Africa, all of which were former colonies. And I recall your writing about the time when you came to Algeria and the Hindi film Aan was being screened there and virtually every Algerian had seen it. And the passions it aroused about what that country had suffered under colonialism. And this is obviously not British colonialism. And you used a wonderful word there called 
depersonalization. And I think that that really comes back to the to the human rights uh, poser that you that you just brought forward. Was there an element of depersonalization in the British attitude to India under Churchill, just as there was in the French in Algeria? That's a that's a lovely question, Rob. My personal view, I think Indians were too smart and too deeply rooted in their sense of Indianness and their identity that we could not be depersonalized. But you know, if you want to really read a fine book on how British, particularly the British liberals, tried to depersonalize India. Read Uday Mehta's Liberalism and Empire. I think it's uh, it was published a good 12, 15 years back. But for me, it is a powerful book which really talks about how these enlightened people that the liberals were actually put forward the hypothesis, the thesis that India had no culture, it was a tabula rasa, and therefore anything could be written on that slate of uh, uh, material with whatever letters you wanted, which was utter and total nonsense. And it took a Max Muller, a German living in Oxford who had never been to India, to write the definitive first translations of the great Indian books of religion, philosophy, logic, and everything else. And those books were accessed by Emerson and Thoreau. And that made the bridge between India and the United States, um, which I think is, again, a beautiful story, how ideas travel across continents and across uh, historical times. Before we go on to questions from, from, our, from our audience, I'd like to circle back to where we began and two completely different references to Churchill. One was the, both of which you quote in your book, one was the Nobel citation when he was awarded the Literature Prize in 1953, which said it was awarded for his mastery of historical and biographical description, as well as for brilliant oratory in defending exalted human values. And, and I note the word oratory because it seems to suggest that he spoke beautifully, however short he fell in practice. <laughs> and then you come to another point you've cited, the website, if you will, of the Churchill College in Cambridge, which says, on race, he was backward even in his day. So that, I think, is, in a sense, the conundrum which you really resolved, though I still remain with one question, the title of the book. Where is the contradiction between manipulation and betrayal? What was in your mind when you coined that? You, you, you catch me on a weak point there. Um, isn't uh, aren't manipulation and betrayal kind of related? They are. They are. I mean, what other title could I find? Um, you know, my publisher has a delicious method for book titles. Uh, authors are told that the title should not occupy more than, I think, 45 spaces. Um, but the shorter, the better. So I was struggling with that, and I used this. Uh, somebody else has also commented on it in a book review that the two words are really related, and you're right there. But um, the deeper issue of racism or of reassessment of Churchill, I think the Churchill archives website uses those expressions that you have quoted, those uh, points about uh, how Churchill was on race uh, backward even by his times. Unfortunately, Ramu, not everyone quite buys into that. And there are defenders of Churchill, not just in the Western world, I dare say even uh, in uh, the global south, 
and I think even in India, who would say that Churchill was not really a racist. He simply reflected his times. I think Churchill's racism was deeply ingrained. And I would end this part of the conversation with the letter that Gandhiji wrote to Churchill on the 15th of July, 1944. It's a beautiful letter of eight lines. Uh, Gandhiji had just been released from prison, maybe two months earlier, after two major events in his life, the death of Kasturba and his last major fast in jail when he came close to dying. And he begins that letter by referring to himself as the naked fakir. He says, you've called me the naked fakir and I write to you in that capacity. And he says, basically, um, for, he says, I have to look at, remember the exact words, where he says, trust me and use me for the sake of my people, your people, and the people of the world. Now, I am tormented by the thought that Gandhiji probably racked his brains before he decided on how to write to Churchill. His first direct communication to Churchill. And what, did, what happened to that letter? Threads sent through the Viceroy's office. And Churchill said, we never received it. The Viceroy's office said, we never received it. So two months later, when Gandhiji's staff inquired, uh, and they were told that letter was not received, I'm sure they sent a copy of the letter. But Churchill had the audacity, the ill judgment, and the crass rudeness of not responding to the only effort that Gandhiji made to him directly, person to person, asking for some action to anticipate the partition. That's what he was talking about, really, in the name of humanity. And Churchill did nothing about that between um, July 44, when he, of course, received the letter, till July 1945, when he lost the election. How, with what temerity could uh, the Nobel literature jury give him a prize for his writing, which was probably deserved in some ways, evoking human values? Actually, audacity and crass rudeness might have fitted into 45 spaces. So you could have had that as an alternative. Thanks so much, sir. <laughs> and uh, let me throw this open to questions we've received. We have uh, one from Malvika Sharad, who asks whether Churchill's background in trade affected his indifference and exploitative attitude towards India. Had he been what she calls a pure statesman, would he have dealt with India differently? I don't know what is meant with the, by the question, uh, what's the difference between being a pure statesman and what? What's the alternative? Right, she, sorry, just to add, she <clears throat> elaborates, how can we reflect on statesmanship from a liberal democratic lens versus a capitalist conservative lens? I'm sorry, I'm not the right person to be able to respond to that because I don't see the ideological divisions as you see them perhaps in this respect. I think Churchill was a major leader and leaders have to lead and, I, and they have to decide on important issues and Churchill utterly failed to do that. Please remember, in 1943, Churchill told Phillips, who was uh, uh, one of, Church, one of uh, Roosevelt's aides, who raised the question of India with him. He said, there will be a bloodbath in India 
which will make every other event look like a picnic. So he anticipated the bloodbath of uh, partition in 1943, but he did not lift one finger to prepare for it. How, how can this be rationalized? There's a question from Karthik Bansal, who quotes you about Churchill's contempt coming from his ignorance about Indian heritage, philosophy, political statecraft. And yet, the fact that he made such limited efforts to modernize India for Indians. Do you see this as a dichotomy in his person? Well, it's not so much dichotomy. It is actually very simple. It's hypocrisy. See, when Wavell went as Viceroy to India, uh, Wavell took over in October 1943. That's right, October 1943. He received instructions in the shape of three points. He was asked to, uh, where are my notes? Uh, he was asked to overcome the differences between communities. The very differences that Britain had fostered, had engineered, going back to Minto's 1906 decision to have communal electorates in India. I mean, that's where it all started, number one. A second demand made to him was to end the caste system. I mean, it beggars the imagination that the instructions given to the Viceroy how to end the caste system. And the third demand um, to raise the living standards of the Indian people. How do you raise the living standards of the Indian people after having looted and raped the country for 250 years and reducing it from a major one quarter contributor to the global economy in 1750 to a 2% contributor to the global economy. This is the biggest, shall we say, tribute to the achievements of British colonialism. And this fraudulent man that Churchill was, had the audacity to give these instructions to Wavell. And mind you, uh, Churchill only had contempt for Wavell, which he, which he articulated on numerous occasions. You've quoted the, the correspondence with Wavell, but I just wondered, sir, in your uh, reading of the archives, did you have a sense, since most of them emanated from, from the household, as it were, that there was, to use your word, a winnowing, that they, they were selective in what was put out in the public domain, or did you really have access to the entirety? Sir Ramu, we just don't know. It was Winston Churchill who personally screened the papers that were sent to the archives. This is known. The archives, the Churchill archives, has scrupulously retained every piece of communication that they received. And Ramu, you remember, uh, I'm the fellow who located in the National Archives Jinnah's first letter to Churchill, which is dated 2nd January 1941, in which Jinnah makes the preposterous claim that 90% of the Muslims of British India are his supporters. This is total nonsense uh, in uh, Punjab. There was Sikandar Hayat Khan, uh, who was uh, the, uh, the chief minister of Punjab uh, in the, under the devolved uh, provincial administration, who died tragically of a heart attack uh, sometime in late 41 or 42. Um, and then there was the uh, um, Khilafat movement and uh, all their supporters in the northwest, front, northwest frontier province where a, a Congress ally uh, won the one power. The, it, was, it was not won by a Muslim coalition, the Northwest Frontier Province. So 
the point I want to make is that this was really part of a deeper British plan to leave behind a fractured, fragmented India. Um, that aspect deserves much closer examination. I'm not the person uh, with the capacity or the ability to make it, but I hope somebody takes this up. And the archival documents, mind you, are, are slowly emerging. I'm told that the Wavell papers are possibly going to be transferred to the Churchill archives. I believe they are negotiating uh, the archives and the Wavell uh, family, uh, his descendants are negotiating the transfer of those papers. And there must be something in those papers uh, which is pretty important. We have the president of CSEP, uh, Rakesh, Rakesh Mohan with us. Did you wish to uh, intervene, sir? Yeah, uh, I just uh, want to uh, thank, uh, first of all, Kishan for uh, sharing his deep erudition. Uh, I learned a lot from the last half of the session because I was, unfortunately, I had to be on another international call for the first half hour. So I wish I'd learned, I would have learned even more had I been in the first half hour. So that will induce me to read the book finally. Um, Kishan uh, is a man of many talents uh, and interests. Um, I always relate how I first got to know him. Uh, he's heard this a hundred times. Uh, it is, uh, Ramo, you will recall also uh, just when the 1991 economic reforms were announced, the most excited letter I got was one Mr. Kishan Rana as High Commissioner of Mauritius. Uh, so I thought he must be mad uh, uh, to be so excited for what the things that we were doing. And you were, of course, at the center of it as well, Ramu. <laughs> <laughs> and so that started a long, long friendship. Uh, regrettably, because I was away from India for almost 10 years off and on, uh, we have not seen each other very much, but that doesn't seem any difference. Of course, I also saw him when he was ambassador in Germany. Um, the, I just want to make... Uh, uh, and of course, uh, Ramu, I want to thank you very much. In some sense, this is your first uh, appearance, uh, just about, uh, for CSEP, uh, where you are our uh, visiting fellow, visiting senior fellow. Uh, is it the first or you? I think maybe you had one more before. Oh, this first. This is the first one. So I hope that uh, this first one means that this will now, the association will continue in a more uh, detailed fashion and more frequently. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, when you talked about uh, some people regarding Winston Churchill as a liberal. So as it happens, currently I'm reading the uh, biography of Macaulay, um, Tom Macaulay, uh, Thomas Macaulay. Um, and that also comes out there that in the, uh, in, in the British uh, environment at that time, uh, he was, of course, a member of the Whig party. And so he was also regarded as a liberal at that time. But uh, his contempt for India was, despite the fact that he served here, what, five years or six years, uh, he had, from, from, from this uh, biography, uh, he had nothing but contempt for India. So one of the famous uh, statements of his, of course, is that all of Indian literature is not equivalent to one shelf of European books. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is a quote, apparently. So, and also interesting that in those days, of course, the voyage to India took about four months plus. So in those, and he, he was a real polyglot. Um, and in those four months, he apparently learned, I think, Latin, French, and... Um, uh, Spanish, I think, if I'm or Greek, I forget which one. But the point is that coming to India, he was learning these European languages. Of course, he was brilliant in the sense that he could do it in four months and took all the materials with him to learn it. But he had no interest in any Indian language. And despite being a polyglot, despite being very good at languages, all his time in India, he never learned any Indian language, whether Bengali, Hindi, or anything else. And so my point is that it's very similar to what is being described with Churchill, that on the one hand, 
pe some people think of uh, Churchill and Macaulay at a different time um, as liberals. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, this is the kind of attitude they had to India and Indians. However, one also has to say that both his father, this Macaulay's father and himself, were leaders in the abolitionist movement of slavery. So he, and also his minute, his famous minute in English, we are all, at least all of us here, uh, Macaulay's children. Um, so um, his famous minute on, on introducing English in Indian education, uh, whereas he had contempt for Indians in general, but he, through this minute in English, he wanted to uh, get natives to learn English so they could become part of the elite and also join in the governance of India. And of course, he meant this for others also in other countries. So there are always these kind of uh, contrasts in some of these historical personalities who've had a huge, huge impact on India till today. Um, so, I mean, for example, I would just say personally that even though I grew up as a Hindi speaking person and always spoke Hindi at home, I sort of feel ashamed that because all my education and particularly professional education has been in English, as Secretary of Ministry of Finance, as Chief Economic Advisor, as Deputy Governor of Reserve Bank, I couldn't give interviews in Hindi, you know, which is ridiculous actually. But anyway, this is going off the topic, but I just wanted to make this point that there, there was such a, for 150 years or whatever, there was this kind of racism where uh, the, 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 the whole British Raj made us feel that we were inferior. Uh, because they were clearly convinced that we were. Uh, and that has got into our, our heads for a you know, long, long time. Uh, final, just one another comment. Uh, you talked about India being represented in San Francisco. Uh, it's very interesting because India was also represented in Bretton Woods in 1944. So I often say on a lighter note that I was there because the person who represented us was the first economic advisor Ministry of Industry. So <laughs> I was in that position many 50 years ago, whatever number of years later. So I always said, look, I was there since my predecessor was, was there, um, uh, although he was British, uh, Colonel Gregory. So it's very, I, mean, I'm, I was always surprised, did quite understand how India was invited to the Bretton Woods Conference. And it seems it's the same thing for the San Francisco Conference for the UN Charter. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that and just thank you very much, Kishan, and thank you very much, Rahul, for this really absorbing, uh, very interesting flagship dialogue. Um, and of course, as I said, now I'll have to read a book. Thank you very much. Um, I won't say anything except uh, to convey my deep, deep thanks to CSEP, uh, to Rakesh personally, to uh, everybody else, Constantino, Xavier, and all the friends at C CSEP who have helped me uh, over some period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.